All right, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and welcome to Radio.com. It is our uh, new home. We also will be uh, part of the Fans Day each day starting at 6 o'clock. So first, let me wish everybody a uh, happy new year. It's good to be back for everybody here on Radio.com. And as we said, our new schedule, let me give you that first as we begin the new year and our new schedule. We will have the five-minute uh, morning for you every morning uh, at 7.30. That will be up live, or you can... Download it anytime during your morning or during your day. Uh, that will be available. And then at 5 o'clock, there will be new content presented every day. Most days that will be live on Radio.com at 5 o'clock. Um, most times it will be sports. We also sometimes will have split content. Some will be uh, political. We are going to follow the uh, 2020 presidential campaigns and elections and everything else. So we will do some uh some political commentary and, and political shows called uh, Decision 20, which we will uh, begin as we head towards uh, the first of the many primaries coming up next month. Um, and then we will obviously do our sports stuff, as we will do for all the big events and everything else, uh, daily at 5 o'clock on radio.com. And then we will go over to uh, Fan. Now, if you're wa listening on Radio.com or watching us on Radio.com, you don't have to leave. You can stay because the 6 to 6.30 program, which will be up on WFAN in New York, uh, my home for the last uh, 35 years, will, uh, uh, will be also available to you. It will be simulcast uh, on Radio.com. So you never have to leave Radio.com. Just switch on WFAN uh, if you're in the metropolitan area uh, anyway. Um, but uh, we will be on WFAN from 6 to 6.30 uh, each night. Uh, it's a busy time. There's a lot of stuff to get to. Uh, we will get to a bunch of it today in the hour. Albert Breer will join us to kind of chase down some of the uh, signings today. As you probably know today, a guy who was on the giant list, I don't know how seriously he was on the list because I just didn't see a match between McCarthy and Gettleman, although the Giants were, or most of the stories following the Giants were mentioning McCarthy as a prominent candidate. I didn't see the mix between Gettleman and McCarthy. I didn't see them uh, operating together. Uh, and he has now signed a five-year deal with the Dallas Cowboys uh, to be their head coach. Um, also, he has been promised that he will have some say in personnel. Remember, Jerry Jones makes the personnel decisions there along with Steven. Uh, and they do get input. They like input from their coaching staff. But the final say always is, of course, Jerry and Steven Jones. They make the final decisions. And... The reports are that Mike Nolan, longtime defensive coordinator, known very well to New York Giant fans, Mike Nolan uh, will be Mike McCarthy's defensive uh, coordinator. Mike is an offensive coach, as you know. He has spent the last year really working feverishly to get back into the league. He was not happy with leaving. Uh, he was not happy with the way he was portrayed leaving. He has spent this year working on staff. He has spent this year working on analytics and different presentations and new things about the league. So he's gone into some uh, deep research and deep, really a deep investigation of where the league is right now in his year off. Uh, and I'm sure he's raring to go uh, with a talented Cowboy roster, which is what he inherits. Uh, so Mike McCarthy, the veteran head coach, uh, and probably the most ready to win of all the head coaches who would be able to be available right now, this side of Urban Meyer, who I don't gather is even a candidate in these situations from what I understand. Um, at least I have not heard that he is. Uh, so McCarthy winds up going uh, to the uh, Cowboys. For the Giants, as far as their uh, head coaching position, um, the name that I... Mentioned, and I, I was one of the first, if not the first, to mention him back way in the season, is that the Giants were looking at Matt Rule. Uh, there was no question they were. I had mentioned that back in November. It might have been in October. I'm not even sure what month it was. But uh, I heard that a long time ago. He has been prominently mentioned. Uh, I don't know how comfortable he will be with Gettleman. I don't know where that stands right now. Uh, I don't have any inside information on what the Giants are feeling about the candidates, but I had heard his name and I had mentioned it on the air on the fan many times during the fall. I had heard his name, so he has been a legitimate candidate for the Giants. 
how how deep they are with other candidates, I'm not sure. Uh, wh whether or not they are looking at the Patriot guys as serious contenders, I'm not sure. Uh, and I think the Giants, uh, which I'll get into much more when I uh, get to WFAN later in the uh, evening after we start the 6 o'clock show, I'll tell you what I think about what the Giants did with Sherman, what they did with Gettleman, and where they should go from here, and what mistakes they made or what right moves they made. I'll get into all that a little later on. Uh, so you still have a couple openings. Uh, you had a big one filled today with the Cowboys. And you have one of the most prominent coaches uh, off the board with uh, Mike McCarthy becoming the uh, Cowboy head coach. So the Cowboys who want experience, who think they're very close, and that's what this is telling you. The Cowboys weren't looking for a makeover. The Cowboys were looking for someone who they believe can, along with a, the right guy to call the defenses. There was a lot of the Cowboy problems this year with defensive. They didn't take the ball away at all did not play good defense. They did not play up to their ability. The Cowboys had a very good roster this year. And they did not play anywhere near up to their ability this year, with a couple of notable exceptions in the season. Uh, and they never should have fallen to the Eagles, who were so beat up. Uh, the Eagles obviously got another bad break yesterday with the injury to Wentz. But hey, they did make the playoffs, and they did have their moment this year. So they got about as much out of that depleted roster as they could. It was a crazy weekend in the NFL, no question about it. I mean, uh, wild card weekend has become that. The road teams continue to do very well, as they did again. Uh, they had the first, last two years. They did again this year. Um, when you watch and see a year where Brady and Breeze get knocked out of the playoffs at home, by lowest-seeded teams, quarterbacked by Tannehill and Cousins, you know there is a change coming in the league. Uh, Tennessee did some things very well. They got a superb game from Henry. You know, the, Pat, the Pats did not play bad defense in that game. They were terrible offensively, but they played solid defensively. And Henry still wound up with a tremendous game. I mean, he he looks like uh, he right now he looks like he came down from a higher league with his size and his speed with and his ability to break tackles uh, with what he's bringing to the game right now. I mean, like I said, he got 182 yards on 34 carries, and I thought the Pats actually played well defensively. That shows you what kind of dominant game he had. And you saw running backs be a very, very big factor in this wild card weekend. Cook was an enormous factor for the Vikings. Henry was an enormous factor for the Titans. Now, the Titans had some other things that went really well. Vrabel had a good game plan, which you knew he would. They got a superb performance from their punter, who really hit the special teams battle was won by the Titans, which is a shock whenever you're dealing with the Pats. Having the special teams battle be won by anybody but the Pats is a big shock. And that was the case. Kern, ha Kern who made All-Pro at, at the punting position, uh, was absolutely superb in just nailing down incredible field position as he did on the last seconds of the game, which led to that pick six, which really only impacted you if you had taken the Pats on a teaser. Other than that, they, you know, the Pats were beaten at that point. Uh, they were going to lose off a scoreless second half, and instead, obviously, the tip ball on a pick six only could have affected you from a teaser standpoint. There was nothing else that was really going to matter there. Um, unless you were like someone I know who bet the Tennessee Titans to score a touchdown defensively so in the game. So if you did that, well, kudos to you. I hope you got paid handsomely for that. Uh, but the Pats didn't win a turnover battle, which they usually do. They didn't win a special teams battle, which they usually do. And they did not control the part of the game, which is the part of the game they always control. The final couple of minutes of the first half, the, fi the first couple of minutes of the second half. The Pats like to pick up seven to ten points in that time period. And instead, this game was lost there. The Pats, if you remember, had a first and goal from the one-yard line. And were about to go up 17-7 in the final minutes of the first half. They don't get in the end zone there. And instead, they have to give the ball back 
after kicking a field goal to Tennessee, and Henry put on a show, basically going the length of the field himself. And instead of the Pats leading 17-7 at the half and being very much in command, they were down 14-13 and went on to score a Zippo in the second half. So that couple of minutes, which is usually where the Pats do their best work, going into the half, coming out of the half, they instead lost the game there this week. So a lot of the things that you became so used to with the Pats we're not there. Is this Brady's last game in Foxborough? I do not know. Is it his last game overall? I doubt it. Do you believe the rumors of him going to the Chargers? Hey, I don't know. There might be uh, 100 Tom Brady rumors before we finally see what, where he winds up and how this plays itself out. I just don't know. We'll have to wait and see. But give Tennessee a world of credit. They did a nice job. They were well prepared by Vrabel, who obviously knows his way around uh, Foxborough. We knew the Pats were vulnerable. I thought they'd get through this game and then really take their lumps the next weekend. I did not think they were going anywhere this year, but I did think they'd get through this game because I thought they'd shut Tennessee down, and they really did. They just couldn't score any points. And let's be honest, it wasn't a very good year for the Pats. They did not do the job from a personnel standpoint at wide receiver or at tight end. They missed the boat in every way, and left Tom with no weapons. And I think more it's about that. And I know now you're hearing the rumors Tom had a bad foot. Tom had a tennis elbow. That's fine. Tom could still throw the ball. The problem is he didn't have any receivers who were getting separation. And lo and behold, a guy who I think is a Hall of Fame player in Edelman had a huge drop that would have been a first down. Uh, You expect Edelman never to drop a ball. That is critical. And he did, and that just was emblematic of the whole Pat year, that Edelman had a big drop in a big spot when they needed to move the chains and keep the drive going in, in, in a late-game situation. So the Pats go home and the Tennessee Titans move on. Uh, the Bills have to be very unhappy with how they lost their game. I don't think they're unhappy with their season, nor I think are they unhappy with how they played. Allen showed some inexperience late in that game under pressure, but you expect that. He'll get better with that. And Buffalo knows exactly what it needs to get better. And Watson, may, he willed that game. He made some plays, and he willed that game. And he, got, he escaped with one of the most crazy dynamic escapes that we've ever seen, almost reminiscent of Eli's escape in the Super Bowl that beat the Pats, uh, but escaped and wound up making a very big play that led the uh, Texans to a tremendous, for them, because any win in the postseason is a tremendous win for them, come from behind win against the Bills that they finally got the game. won in overtime after you know trailing as they did, Uh, in that game and playing as miserably as they did in the first half of that game to come back and win the way they did uh, was uh, what they needed. It would have put a lot of pressure on that that head coach. Uh, It looked like they were going to have another long playoff outing, and instead they uh, bounce back and get themselves a win and get to live and play another day, which they will this weekend in Kansas City, which will not. I know they've won there, but it was not going to be easy this time around. Not at all against this Kansas City team, which is playing really well. Both teams that will be home and will be heavy favorites in the divisional playoff round are playing really well. Baltimore's playing as well as probably any team has in the league in about five or six years. And Kansas City's playing very well now that they've figured out Spag's defense, and we know what kind of weapons they have on offense. And then you had Minnesota which was going to be healthier than it had been because Cook, who you know, you've heard me so many times singing the praises of, of Cook and how good a player I think he is. You saw it again yesterday, how dynamic he can be in these games, how important he was in this game. But also give Zimmer and the Vikings credit because they really did a number on, uh, on the Saints. They were better prepared. They had a better game plan. 
they knew, you know, the Saints came in red hot. Breeze had had 15 touchdowns and no picks in recent weeks. They had been scoring points at will. He had not been sacked in four of the last five games. And what did they do? They got great inside pressure from Griffin and Hunter, who shared three sacks, and put enormous pressure on Breeze, who looked very much his age. He had a lot of trouble throwing the deep ball, which he does now. And one of the big problems for the Saints yesterday was Breeze was their second-best quarterback, and if that's the case, it's going to be a tough game to win. They were better when the jack-of-all-trades was behind center, better than when Breeze was behind center, and it was never more uh, obvious than when Hill had just made that sensational play down the left sideline. Breeze comes back the next play and fumbles the ball. The pick before the half was incredibly costly. He underthrew that ball badly. And at times, Brady and Breeze look their age. But to me, Brady looks to me like he can still play and still make any throw. Breeze can still play, especially when he's getting protection because he's incredibly accurate and he can do that, run that offense in his sleep. But he does no longer have the ability to get the ball down the field. And that was very obvious yesterday. And, ha- and it was obvious to me the last year, and the Saints have found a way to lose. And listen, they deserved to lose yesterday. They were outplayed. Now, the last play, which has started to gain some momentum as to whether that should have been reversed or not. And I know a lot of that came from the fact that last night, both Rodney Harrison and Tony Dungy thought it was offensive pass interference. We know the Saints got screwed last year. I did not think that play merited a flag. Did he use, did Rudolph use his arm to gain a little positioning and the ward of the defender? Absolutely. Would you have dropped the flag on that play? No. Would you reverse a touchdown on that play? I couldn't see it. I did not think, and I think, again, the NFL had a very weak officiating weekend on a lot of levels. It was about to be one of the worst one ever if they had ever called that start of the third quarter a live ball and a touchdown, which they didn't, thank God, because we've been watching guys give themselves up that way on returns all year. So if that had been called, and luckily the alternate judge officials jumped in and said, what are you doing? But just the idea that that was even called. And some of the, pl- fa- uh, the flags that were picked up show you how bad the officiating is, and I don't like combo crews in big spots. They have no cohesion. They have no continuity. They don't trust each other. And they don't help each other enough. So it leads to bad officiating. And the NFL had a good weekend. They got great games. They didn't always get well-played games, but they got great drama in a lot of the games. And even in the game where you lose your starting quarterback and wind up with a guy who shouldn't be playing quarterback playing quarterback, the game was not bad. I mean, they knocked on the door a couple of times and give the Eagles credit for fight. I mean, the puzzling thing there was it didn't look like Wentz took that bad a hit to be out of that game the rest of the way, but... You can never question that. So it was an exciting weekend because the Buffalo-Houston game got dramatic, if nothing else. It got very dramatic. And then you watched as the Pats lose, which made a lot of America happy to finally see them lose the way they did. And then to have another tight game in Minnesota pulling off the upset and give Minnesota credit. And let's, get, let's give a couple of quarterbacks who have been so much maligned I've killed Tony Hill through the years. I never trusted Tony Hill in a big spot. I couldn't trust him this weekend. I couldn't trust Cousins this weekend. I had to see them make the plays, and you know what? I did. They made the plays. If I had to do again, would I pick against both of them? Probably. I mean, would I pick Tony Hill or Brady? I'm going to pick Brady. Would I pick Cousins or pick Breeze? I pick um, on the road. I'm going to pick Breeze, but. Let's be honest, Cousins and Tanny Hill made the plays. The third and eight play that Tanny Hill made, that, cha- that was vindication for him. He made the third and eight play with Henry off the field. They had to get the first down there. He made the throw. 
And then Cousins, who had made the big play, turned around and made the third and eighth throw to Rudolph. Both guys got their vindication and sent two legends to the showers for the season in doing it. So we have a new guard here. You have Wilson and Rogers squaring off in one game, which means you'll have one of the Super Bowl winning quarterbacks in one of the title games. And in the other three spots at quarterback in the title games, you're going to have new guys who are looking to become champions. Because the six other quarterbacks are now trying to make something special to their playoff resume, including the ones who are getting all the attention, Mahomes and Jackson. All right, a lot going on in the league right now. Let's get to Albert Breer. Albert, welcome. How are you? Good. How are you, Mike? All right, let's start with the, the Cowboys today. We know all the teams were in on McCarthy. We know the Giants were talking to him. We know the Panthers. And Tepper, who has a lot of money, we're talking to him. Uh, did the Cowboys swoop in quick and make the deal? And what made the Cowboys the right spot? Well, I think the roster, for one, um, you know, it's probably of the, all the openings that the, the the team that you can see competing for a Super Bowl the soonest. And so I think that appealed to Mike McCarthy. Um, you know, and I think certainly having a, a strong personnel department in place. And I think a lot of times, Mike, when, when guys have some options and they're looking at different jobs, it's, you know, a big part of it becomes, okay, where did I have trouble last time? And, you know, I know that McCarthy and his staff felt like at the end in Green Bay, and this is not new general manager, Brian Goodison, which is sort of on the old one, Ted Thompson, uh, the scouting department had slipped, and the roster wasn't in great shape. And so, um, yeah, I think that was a big part of his decision-making process, too, was going to a place where he felt like the roster was consistently going to be taken care of. You can say what you will about the Jones family and their involvement in football. That roster has been plenty talented over the last 10, 12, 14 years. And there have been good players there pretty consistently on through. And so, you know, I think as much as anything else, uh, you know, the, 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 the players on hand appeal to, to, to Mike McCarthy. And, of course, the Cowboys being aggressive and getting out in front of it the way that they did, um, being able to make an offer to him um, as quickly as they did after letting Jason Garrett go, I think gave them a leg up. Uh, Albert, um, there's been word that Mike's been working on his staff. Yeah. Uh, was Mike Nolan part of that the whole way, or did the Cowboys have mm-hmm. some input into Mike Nolan? No, Mike Nolan was part of it the whole way. You may remember Mike Nolan actually gave Mike McCarthy his first coordinator job uh, back in 2005 when Mike Nolan became the head coach in San Francisco. Um, he named Mike McCarthy his offensive coordinator, and McCarthy left for the Packers' head coaching job the next year. And so this was something that had sort of been arranged for a while. And um, you can see um, <laughs> you can see the plans that have been in place with you know how the Saints seem to have no issue letting him go. Um, they sort of knew this was coming. And there are going to be other pieces to the staff in place, too. I, I expect that Jim Hazlitt will be on board pretty quickly um, as, the, uh, as, the, as the linebackers coach. And you know, then the offensive staff, they're going to have to make some decisions on Kellen Moore and some other guys who are still in their contracts. But um, yeah, this thing's going to move pretty quickly. I think the Cowboys had an idea of how they wanted this set up. And, um, you know, maybe not as they didn't move as fast as the Redskins did, but they moved pretty fast in putting things together. Do you think the Cowboys came in and swooped McCarthy away from either the Panthers or the Giants, or do you think that McCarthy wasn't at the top of the Giant at, or Panther list? I think he was under consideration in both places. I do not think he was at the top of either of those lists. Um, if you ask me, I think Josh McDaniels is on top of the Panthers list, and I think Matt Rule is on top of the Giants. I list. started hearing yeah. Matt Rule in October. That's the name I started <laughs> yeah. hearing. I said it on the air in either October or November. I started hearing the name. Uh, I know the ties. I Rule, I'll, but I'll, do you I'll, think I'll, Matt Rule is still the hot guy right now? I haven't heard anything new. Is he still the hot guy? Yeah, yeah and I'll want to be there, Mike. I, 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 I'd actually heard him <laughs> going back to what Pat Schumer was hired. So, I, uh, you know, I, I think it's somebody that they see as a, as a right prospect going all the way back to 2012 when he was actually in the building. He's from the area, you know, as you know, um, east side of Manhattan. I don't know Matt Rule. Uh, Even though he's from New York and he was there for a year, I did hear this, though, last year, and I know this for a fact. The Jets were very high on Matt Rule, but they got bogged down on Matt Rule was adamant about he was going to pick his staff and he was not going to let anybody interfere with that, and that backed them off 
rule. Uh, I know that because exactly I've been. Uh, yeah, I know that happened. Now the question is this: He's got Gettleman there interfering. Will he be able to work there, and or will they hit an impasse in this right now if they try to get a deal? Will he be as adamant as no. he was last year? I think he will be adamant about certain things. I think he is fine with Dave Gettleman. Um, and, you know, I think because of Gettleman's age, you know, you're probably going to be working on the idea that you're, you know, you're going to have a heir apparent place. They think a lot of Kevin Abrams there, as I'm sure you know, um, the assistant general manager. I think the big thing from the big thing I've gotten um, from Rule's camp on this is one, he wants to be able to, con- he wants to, be able to hire his own coaches, which is fair, right? Like hire his own. Coaches. I think he yeah, should be able to absolutely. And that was the problem. That was the problem with the with the Jazz last year is that he wanted to bring in Sean Ryan as his offensive coordinator, and they wanted to you know give him Todd Munkin and give him Greg Williams on defense. And I don't think it was even so much he didn't like those guys; he didn't like the idea of having a staff kind of pieced together by someone else. So I think it's fair, you know, that, that, that he wants to hire his own coaches. And you know, the second thing that you want to watch here is after what happened last year with the Jets, he's just a little leery about anything that gives him the idea that it's going to be a circus or that the structure of a place is going to be a problem. And because he worked for the Giants before, he's got insight into what that building looks like on the inside. And I know there was one of the issues that he had with the Giants. There's just been too many people there that have been there for too long. And um, you know, people who've been in their jobs for 20 or 30 years, um, you know, he felt like, um, like kind of what has been seen as stable in the past may have gotten a little stale and some things need to be updated there. And so, you know, I think if, if he gets those two things, if he's able to hire his own coaches and the Giants promise to maybe update some of their processes and move some people around and, you know, structure the thing, structure the thing that in, in, in a more modern way, which, I mean, we've already heard Gettleman say that, it, you know, that they're planning on doing that. Um, you know, then I think you would absolutely be of a mind to take the job um, because, you know, again, it's one of these, and it's one of 32 to begin with, but it's also one that's very close to where he grew up, and there are only two of those. Is, is, so if, if he's clearly still the leader in the clubhouse, if he isn't, doesn't work out for any of the reasons we just mentioned, we're talking about yeah. Albert Bria, who's the next giant guy? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I look at, Josh McDaniels is being another name that they, you know, I think the upper management there likes him. Um, the question, I think, would be whether or not he would do it. Are they ready to? Are they would. they're not expecting him to do what he did to Indianapolis again, right? Then I don't think he's no, going to pull no, one no, of those. No, he's not going to be no. one of these turn around a plane deals again. <laughs> no, no, no. And I, and I think I think Josh has had a pretty clear vision of what he wants from a structure standpoint, and I think it's more likely he winds up in Cleveland or Carolina. Um, so, you know, then I think we're talking about going down the line after those two. Um, you know, I would I would make a phone call to somebody like David Shaw at Stanford. I know that they've sort of kicked the tires on him in the past. I don't think he'll leave. Never, yeah, I don't think he's he'll He's never leave. been willing to leave. He's never been willing to leave. But I think he would be somebody that you'd make a phone call to. Um, you know, Eric Bieniemy is another one. I, I just don't know about hiring somebody with without a ton of experience. Um, into the into into what exists right now with the Giants, um, you know, a guy who hasn't run a program, um, you know, but his name's obviously been out there a bunch. Chris Richard interviewed, so there are some names, but I think that at this point, Mike, I I almost have a hard time giving you a number two because Matt Rule is such a clear number. Okay, one. now what are you thinking? And 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 I think that I mean, listen, I don't know anything that's I haven't heard anything different. I I like I said, I started hearing Rule uh, back. Around Halloween. I mean, so uh, I, that's the name I started hearing. What do you think Tepper is going to do, you know, in, in Carolina? And what do you think? And Cleveland yeah. has stated they want a head coach with experience. So where does that leave them if they want a guy who's experienced? Well, you know, what's interesting is that, like, Paul D. Podesta um, is so involved now in, in that search. And he has been, uh, in my understanding, is basically 50-50 on questions to candidates in the interview room with Jimmy Haslam. Like, he is as involved as the owner as far as asking questions. Um, you know, but, like, there's no guarantee that he'll be with the organization when all of this is done. Um, and one of the reasons why Jimmy Haslam listens to him is because he's been right in the past and Haslam hasn't listened to him. In um, 2016, he told them, go hire Sean McDermott. They wind up hiring. 
Hugh Jackson last year. They told, he told them, go hire Kevin Stefanski. Who I think they wind up hiring. Uh, pretty kitchen. And they so made a good. big mistake. And they, they, they yeah. you know why they listened to Baker Mayfield? That's exactly why they let the yeah. quarterback. And, they let the quarterback pick the coach. Yep. Yeah, and so um, you know, I think Cleveland. Like I, I think right now, if if, if they listen to Deep Down, he'll probably tell them to go back to the fans and still in the playoffs with the Vikings. Um, you know, but I think the owner is the owner really likes the idea of Josh McDaniels. I can tell you that. He's gotten some pushback, but you know I, I do think the owner likes the idea of McDaniel's. McDaniel's has a very uh, defined vision for what he wants for an organization, and um, you know I think one of the reasons there is some pushback against Josh is because a lot of people recognize a lot of people in that building now recognize that there will be a lot of people gone if Josh winds up getting the job, and so I think Josh very much has a shot at getting that job, um, and you know I, I think Stefanski will be the other one to watch. And then, if you if you want to look at um, if you want to look at Carolina, you know, again, this is another one where the owner has a close relationship with the craft and has an affinity for that model. And so, I think they're very much in on it. Josh too, and, and they're going to interview Josh McDaniels in Boston tomorrow. Um, so, the Panthers, I think, will be involved with with McDaniels. I, I think they're another one that's at least going to make a play for rule. Um, there's sort of you know, and, and it's interesting because. Uh, there's like these moving parts right now where, um, you know, you got rule with the Panthers now with the Giants starting tomorrow. And then you got McDaniels with the Giants on Wednesday, the Browns on Tuesday, and then the, or the, Brown, the, 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 the Giants on Wednesday, the Panthers on Tuesday and the Browns on Friday. And sort of and there. So you got these two candidates that are sort of both, I think in the running for both the Giants and the Panthers, in the running for those three jobs. And you sort of see where each one of them falls. So it's a small candidate pool, no question. I'd say McDaniel's and Stefanski and Rule are uh, are all in play for multiple jobs on those three. And it'll be really, really interesting to see how it plays out. Talking with Albert Beer, NFL right now. Obviously, as you know, the big news today: Mike McCarthy goes to the Cowboys, five-year deal. Uh, Mike Nolan is defensive coordinator, and he did state that he is open to keeping Kellen Moore as his offensive coordinator. We'll see if that continues. Uh, now. Mike, uh, Brady is free to leave on March 18th. Uh, He pretty much told everybody last night he's not retiring. Uh, Wants Mm -hmm. to play two to three more years is what I – he told someone that I know very well that he he really – his goal is to play two or three more years and that there will be no home team discount for the Pats anymore. That being the case, you think there's a chance he moves to a – San Diego to the Chargers do you, in that new stadium. Do you think there's a chance he goes to the Colts, who evidently are interested in him? You think there's a chance he yeah. leaves, or you think he goes back to New England? I think there's a chance he leaves, and I, I think a lot of it. I think a lot of it's going to depend on where the Patriots are with a lot of their older players. They got a boatload of guys who are 29 or older, and, and key guys too. You know, Stephon Gilmore, Kyle Van Noy, Jamie Collins, Dante Hightower. Um, you know, an offense, Julian Edelman, Rex Burkhead, um, Patrick Chung, Kevin McCourty, Jason McCourty, some of these guys are free agents. And so, you know, I, I think it's weird that, like, what you do with a quarterback sort of dependent on guys like that, but I think to some degree it is where, you know, you're making a decision, do you want to make another run with the group that you have right now that's really aging and I think showed its age down the stretch, or is it time to rip the Band-Aid off? If they're going to make another run with the, the current group, I don't know that the Patriots have a better option out there at quarterback than Brady, and I don't know that Brady has a better option out there than to play for the Patriots. However, if they decide it's time to hit the reset button, start over and get younger, well, now we're talking about something else entirely. And so, um, you know, I I don't know that Brady's going to have a ton of options when we get to March just because it's hard to go go all in on a quarterback of that age. Um, And... You know, I think there's a very, very real scenario where you know we may be sitting here in January and saying, "Well, you know, he he's really considering leaving, and he really might leave." Uh, but we, but then we get to March, and, and you look around, and the best option that each side has is one another. Uh, it would seem so, unless they, unless they really need him to sell tickets in Los Angeles. I mean, if that's the case, they right. could make a deal with him there where Rivers could leave. He could mm-hmm. go in there and help them sell tickets because they really are having trouble as the second team in that city. They're really having a lot of trouble there. Yeah, yeah. I just think it's it's hard for me to see, Mike. Where would you, if you're him, do you blow it up 
external over. You know what I mean? Like, do you do you say, okay, like I'm going to, I'm going, in, like I'm going to go in and I'm going to be consistent and learn new coaching staff and learn a new building. You know, I like the the Chargers are holding on to Anthony Lund as their head coach, which I think Kalen's done a nice job. Yeah, he, there. he has. And, it's not his fault. You know, yeah, yeah, it's not his fault. Um, you know, but like I, I, I look at, you know, that and it's like, if you're Brady, do you want to, do you want to start all over with just a totally new environment, a place that's going to be new for you in every single way? Um, that's the part that's kind of hard. I also think the one thing that, uh, you know, maybe flying a little bit under the radar is that he does have a son who lives, um, who lives in New York and like, that's a real life family consideration for him. Um, you know, I think he probably, he'd like to be. Um, he'd like to be as close to his son as he possibly can, and being in Boston for these years has sort of facilitated that. It's a, an easy trip for him back and forth to go and see his son, and um, you know, so I think the idea of going far away is a little less appealing for that reason because you know he'd be far further away from a son who lives in New York. The other team that woke up this morning and had no expectations of being in this boat is the Saints. They did not expect this to happen, yeah. uh, especially the way they finished the season. I give the Vikings credit, and we knew the Vikings were talented, and everything clicked for the Vikings just they had a very good game plan. They really hurt the interior of that uh, Saints line. Uh, they they really hurt. They beat up on Pete all game. I mean, they, they did it. They did it and put a lot of pressure on on Breeze. But now that team is in salary cap hell, and they now have failed three years in a row in this spot. Despite the fact they win a lot of games in the regular yeah. season, they got a lot of big personnel decisions to make. They got a very bloated roster. What do they do? The talented roster, though, Mike. I mean, that's the thing is they do have a lot of good players. You know, I. And I like they've drafted really, really well the last three or four years. The challenging thing is going to be that some of those guys now are up for contracts, and especially like the guys in that in that 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 just historic 2017 draft class they had: Marshawn Lattimore, Ryan Ramchick, Alvin Kamara, um, Marcus Williams. Just a really good group there, um, and those guys are you know in the position Michael Thomas was in last year, where. It's time for those guys to get paid, and that can change the makeup of your team and your cap sheets and all the rest of it. So, um, look, like I think they've got a very talented roster, and it'd be appealing, an appealing situation for a, another quarterback to come into if Drew Brees does retire. Um, yeah, but again, this is not unlike New England. Where, um, yeah, they're younger than the Patriots are, but you know, it's not unlike New England in that, like you know, there's just sort of you know a holding pattern to see what's going to happen at the quarterback position. And, um, you know, Breeze comes back, I think they probably find a way to run it back for another year and deal with the fallout, you know, cap-wise and everything else. Maybe you, you kick the can down the road a little bit on that. Um, it's just, like, you have to wait to see what's happening with Breeze. And if, and if he doesn't come back, uh, you know, then obviously you've got a big box decision to make it the most important position. Were you, of the, whether or not. were you of the group um, who thought that was offensive pass interference or no on the last play? I think if they had called it on the field, right? Like, if they call it on the field, I don't think you over like, So, if that goes to review either way, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. So, listen, a lot, like listen they, a, 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 more, than, more than a few people thought it was offensive pass interference. Yeah. I thought it fell a little short of being – I thought if right. it wasn't the Saints – I only reason it went into my head that they might reverse it is because they owed the Saints one. That's the only reason I thought, I thought about it, was, it. I thought it was borderline enough where you watch the play, right, and – like, I just think it was close enough where it's if, you know, they call it one way or the other way, no matter which way they call it, you weren't going to over, overturn it on review. It was, I mean, to me, depending on your vantage point, 60-40, 50-55, 45-50-50 type of call where, you know, whatever they were going to call, whatever they called on the field was probably going to stand. Uh, so now you have a new. We're talking about Albert Breer. You have a new, uh, really a new look to the playoffs. You still have Rodgers and Wilson in one game, so you're going to have a guy with a ring in one of the title games. But you got all these other new faces. You know, you got Jackson yeah. and Mahomes, and you got Tanny Hill and Cousins who have vindicated themselves with those third yeah. down throws. You got Garoppolo. You know, so you got you got uh, Watson. Uh, you don't have a Manning, you don't have Roethlisberger, you don't have Brady, you don't have Breeze, so it is a little bit of a new guard now. Uh, yep. First glance, which of the four road teams, they're all playing in tough spots. 
Um, and maybe this is easy. I'm going to make it harder. Uh, let's leave Seattle at Green Bay out of it. The other three <laughs> games, <laughs> the other three games, which of the, and all three teams go in def- playing well, yeah. you know, Vikings, Titans, yeah. Texans. Which one of the three do you give the best chance to pull the upset? I give the Vikings the best chance. Um, I just think my, the, the NFC is so much deeper than the AFC, you know, and and that sort of proved out over the course of the year where, um, you know, you, I think you have good teams in the NFC that aren't in the playoffs. Um, the Saints, I mean, we talk about the Saints there, right? 13 wins wasn't good enough to get them a bye. Um, and, you know, I, I think you look at a Minnesota Vikings team that was, I mean, seen by a lot of people, myself included, as a Super Bowl team in 2018. Uh, now, they dealt with some injuries and, uh, and all that. They come back this year, you know, and, and they went on that Monday night. Now, all of a sudden, you know, they're one of the teams that's the favorite. So, I think it's an experienced team. They got a good quarterback, despite all the flames and arrows that Kirk's taken over the years. Um, and I think they're capable of going in there and, and, and winning. And so, I, I look at it, Mike, like I think the AFC bracket, to me, Kansas City and Baltimore are clearly the two best teams left on that side of the bracket, and that's been all year. Those two in New England, um, you know, New England's have been flowed some, but for the most part, those have been the three best teams all year. Um, you know, in the NFC, I think it's just been so much more wide open. And so, I mean, I don't think any result, you know, in the NFC um, on, on Saturday or Sunday would, would surprise me. And I'll take it one step further. I, I think any of those four teams could wind up in Miami for the Super Bowl. And, you know, the playoff games is where guys emerge as big stars nationally. That's when guys yeah. – has anybody taken a quicker quantum leap than Henry to superstar status? I mean, he now is yeah. a force in this league. Yep. And he's and, – and it's – I mean, it's interesting because – I, you know how this works, Mike. You know, uh, like at every position, there are prototypes, right? Like this is the the height, this is the weight, this is what you're supposed to look like. Um, this is how you're supposed to run. This is how you're supposed to do X, Y, and Z. And it's so interesting when you look back at Henry coming out in the draft in 2016, and it was just because he doesn't look like a running back. You know, he looks like a defensive end. Um, he doesn't look like a running back. You know, I, I think people were sort of like, okay, well, you know, he's a really good player in Alabama, but what do we do with him? And um, credit to tight. They they, they they decide we're going to draft him and we're going to do exactly with him what Alabama did with him when he won the Heisman Trophy. And, uh, you know, he's become that player. And it's just, it's so interesting because if you go back and you look at it over the course of the year, just count up how many 40, 50, 60 yard runs the Titans had in the fourth quarter of games, right? And that's just, I mean, that's breaking another team's will. And that's what they've been able to do. And, um, you saw it even at the end against New England where, you know, after they pick up the first down on third down, um, they're in first and ten, two minutes left, everybody knows it's coming, and Henry picks up 11 yards off right tackle, and the game's over. And it's just, it's one of those things when they know it's coming and you can still do it. I and mean, that's, I said, this is all about who you are as a team. And so, um, you know, I think there's a, a there's there's a very defined identity to what Mike Vrabel's wanted to build there, and John Robinson wanted to build there, and Derek Henry's the perfect back to kind of accentuate that 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 identity. Um, and we certainly saw it. And I'll tell you what, too, Mike. I mean, in this age, when you're seeing defensive ends and linebackers and safeties get smaller and smaller to try and combat the pass game, I mean, there's a very easy counterpoint there that I think the Titans and, and some other smart teams have taken advantage of, where. Okay, if you're going to get smaller on defense, they can't tackle him. We're going to get a little bit bigger. (laughs) Yeah, they can't tackle. When you put him on the edge, you can't tackle him with a safety or a corner. He runs right over them. He goes. He goes through two of them or three of them. Absolutely true. I mean, he's just so big and strong. And do you believe one game's enough to vindicate Tannehill and Cousins, or do you need more? Well, Tannehill only threw for seventy-two yards. Yeah, but he, he made that. But he had a good finish to the season, the he and he made the, the and he made the big throw that he had to make on third yeah. down with Hill yeah. with Henry off the. And I don't think Henry should have been off the field. He was off the field, and right. he made the third down throw he had to make. Yeah, he did. He did. And I'll, I'll tell you what, like Cousins too. I mean, I, 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 it's funny. I was talking to Kyle Rudolph after the game, and he makes the big catch in the end zone at the end. And, you know, uh, you know, he kept saying, like, this is a team game. And he's like, we've let Kirk down in certain spots this year. And he's had to take the brunt of it. Um, you know, I, I, I still think Kirk Cousins is a very good quarterback who, you know, because of the contract system in Washington and the 
the deal he got in Minnesota. You know, spotlight was always on him. You know, and I think people were always sort of waiting for him to slip up. So they could say, okay, see, 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 there it is. And, um, you know, I think, you know, if you look at him on balance, he really has been a pretty good quarterback all year long, save for maybe the first two or three weeks of the season. And so, um, you know, I think Cousins was on Sunday who he's been for most of the year. You know, in Tannehill, I mean, there's no question. I mean, there's, there's a huge part of that is what they put around him. Yep. And I think it's a great example of how, you know, at that position, you're as much, you know, a prisoner to your circumstances as maybe anybody in any other position. And in Miami, he was in a lot of bad situations. And he didn't play very well. And you put him in Tennessee. You give him two first round picks for tackles. You put Derrick Henry behind him. You give him John New Smith at tight end. And you give him the offensive rookie of the year on one side and the fifth overall pick from a few years ago on the other side. And you let him go and you see a different player. And I think that's so much of it. You know, they don't ask the world of him. And so he's able to, to just go out there and play. And I think that's been a huge part of getting out of Tannehill, what they've been able to get out of Tannehill. And it'll be interesting to see. You know, what happens this week, you know, going into Baltimore, um, where, you know, certainly possible they'll be playing from behind the way that the Ravens have played. Amazingly, though, that's not Mariota doing that. That's Tannehill doing that. You know, he made yep. the change to Tannehill and they started to win. They were losing mm-hmm. and they were just about yep. to lose Tannehill's first game and go to two and five. That's the crazy game they won against the Chargers. Yep. And, and after that, Tannehill goes eight and three as a starter when Mariota couldn't win. Yep, and it's, I mean, like, and, I, and I'll tell you what, like, I, it just feels like Mariota feels to me like Alex Smith did, um, you know, before Harbaugh got to him, where it just feels like he's been through so many coordinators and systems, and like the wiring's messed up now. You know, like, he's just, like, it's almost like he needs a career reset. And so, you almost feel bad for Mariota, but I, you know, I think that that's sort of, it's a great microcosm, too, of a guy who's, you know, at the end, um, it was a team that took him very high where expectations were very high, right? Like, so that's the end for him. And it's a new beginning for a guy who was a high pick somewhere else, but now it's coming in without expectations to a new play. Um, kind of an interesting dichotomy there between the two quarterbacks where, you know, Mariota's, you know, had to handle his expectations and, um, you know, now it's sort of like weaving to the finish line um, at his time there. And then you got another guy who was in that situation a year ago with Miami, and he's got a new start, and he's playing like a completely different guy. Well, listen, great stuff. Thanks very much, Albert. Thanks, and we'll talk to you soon. Happy New Year and everything. Enjoy the divisional week, this week coming up this weekend. Great game, so uh, appreciate it. Thanks very much. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Thank you, Albert Breer. Uh, We talk NFL with him, and again, uh, the Cowboys today named Mike McCarthy their head coach, Mike Nolan their defensive coordinator. So he's off the list. The Giants... Is it Matt Rule? Does he get what he wants? Does he get everything he needs to be the Giant head coach? The uh, former Giant assistant who rebuilt the Baylor Bears, uh, is he ready to be the guy who can do the job with the football Giants? Does he wind up in Carolina? You have Carolina looking for a coach. You have uh, the Browns looking for a coach. You have the football Giants Still looking for a coach. The Cowboys moved swiftly and gave Mike McCarthy uh, five years to be their new head coach. And, yes, he does inherit a a talented roster. For the four games this coming weekend, Saturday's Vikings and Niners. The Niners are six-and-a-half-point favorites. The Titans take on the Ravens. Obviously, the Ravens playing very, very well. That game opened at 10 and went to eight-and-a-half. The Texans, on the other half, on the other side, uh, play early Sunday at the Chiefs. That game opened at 8 and went quickly to 9.5. And, and then the Seahawks and the Raiders and the Ra- uh, Seahawks and the Packers, and the Packers are 3.5-point uh, favorites. Uh, in the evening game on Sunday, the battle between the two uh, Super Bowl-winning quarterbacks, they will meet in what will, I'm sure, be a frigid and uh, snowy Lambeau uh, on a Sunday, on a January Sunday, looking to advance. And we will have one guy in the Final Four for the NFL who will have won a Super Bowl. Only one, because the other six quarterbacks, okay, led, of course, by Mahomes and Jackson, who get all the attention. But guys who have been much, you know, have been criticized heavily, like Tannehill, 
like Cousins, who has been criticized as much as any quarterback in the league, those guys, and, of course, Watson, uh, guys like that, and, of course, Garoppolo, who all he's done is win and has arrived now with the Niners uh, so quickly. These are the guys who are ready to, you know, see if they can take their place. They can kind of put their resume together and see if they're ready to be the one to, you know, join the club and win a championship and join Rodgers and join Wilson at quarterback uh, with Super Bowl uh, titles and rings. So you have those two squaring off and you have the others looking to make their move. And I thought going into the playoffs, you had three teams. And I didn't count the Niners among those teams. I did not think the Niners had played as well down the stretch. And believe it or not, the only reason the Niners were not playing yesterday and the Saints were playing is because the Saints, after taking the lead late in the game in New Orleans, allowed Kittle to get down the field, and they were able to win that game from behind in the final 35 seconds. Otherwise, the Saints would have been off yesterday, and maybe it was the Niners getting beat. And maybe the Saints are going to a Super Bowl. It meant that it was that close. And then for the, for the uh, Niners, they had to withstand the craziness of the Seattle game. Where Seattle had the ball on the one-yard line and obviously let the play clock run down, which was unconscionable. And wound up not scoring. Getting the play to the half-yard line. So that wound up putting the Niners in a very good position and exposing the Saints to the first weekend despite winning 13 games. And here's how outrageous what Cousins did yesterday. Cousins, in his career, in 15 games, in his career against teams that would go on to win 12 or more games that year, meaning whenever they met him during the season or late in the season, when he played teams that went on to win 12 or more games, meaning good teams, you know, he had never won a Monday night game. He had never won a prime time game. When you go through all the things he had not done, he was 1-13-1 against the spread against teams that had won 12 or more games going into yesterday's game. And he makes the plays and makes the throws and got an enormous lift from Thielen being healthy, but also got an enormous lift from Dalvin Cook being healthy because he's a tremendous back who was an enormous factor in that game yesterday. And also give Mike Zimmer credit for it because his defensive game plan yesterday was sensational because the, the Saints were very vulnerable on the interior of their offensive line, and he made sure that Griffin and Hunter killed them inside there. They spun their guards around like tops all afternoon. And that put a lot of inside pressure on Breeze, who had not been had only been sacked in one of his last five games and had been sitting back there and basically just shooting fish in a barrel. And then yesterday he was under pressure all day, and he wound up turning the ball over once by fumble, once by turnover. Enormous turnovers that were killers. Absolutely killers for the Saints. Listen, the Pats had a tough loss on Saturday night. But they've won so much that the only thing that was bad for Pat fans was not so much losing, because they could take losing for a year, but maybe that that was Brady's swan song. But this was a bitter, bitter, horrible loss for the Saints. They won 13 games this year. They waited a year to kick their revenge tour into gear in the postseason, to get everybody back for what happened last year. They were going to pay everybody back. They forgot one thing. Just because you got screwed last year, just because you got a miracle against you the year before, nobody owed you anything in the postseason. You still had to come into the postseason and play. And they got played off their feet right from the start. Vikings opened that game with a turnover yesterday and didn't allow the Saints to get in the end zone. That was the start of it. Saints hit a big play with Hill, not with Breeze, with Hill. That gives them a touchdown. They get a 10-3 lead, and what happens? The Vikings behind Cook come right back down the field and stick it right back in the end zone.
The Vikings were there. They were better. They were tougher. They were more physical. They were better prepared. And they deserved to win yesterday. And that's why, if you're a Saints fan, don't bother whining about whether that was offensive pass interference or not. A, I don't think it was. And B, you know what? You got badly outplayed in that game yesterday. Minnesota came in, pushed you around your own building. 13 wins or no 13 wins. Breeze or no breeze. And a lot of the big Saints, a lot of the big Saints, whether I'm talking about running backs or cornerbacks, played lousy football yesterday. There were a lot of big-name Saints yesterday who didn't show up. A lot of them. Bad game for Breeze. You know he tried. He gave you everything he had, but he also had a lousy game. And like I said, when Breeze is your second-best quarterback when you're the Saints and he's your second-best quarterback on the day, you know you have a long day going. And they had a long day going. All right, when we come back, on our first day back in the new year here on Radio.com, we're going to take a break, and when we come back, we will stay on Radio.com, but we will also join up with our new time period from 6 to 6.30 on WFAN in New York. Hello again, everybody, and it's good to be back here on The Fan. A Happy New Year to everybody on this sixth day of January. I hope everybody had a very, uh, very happy and healthy holidays. It was obviously a very busy time. Been away for a couple of weeks. Good to be back on The Fan, as always, uh, and in our new setup. What we're doing, in case you don't know, is uh, we'll be on Radio.com most nights from 5 until 6. And then we will be on uh, Radio.com continuously till 6.30, but also we will be joined from 6 to 6.30 live each night here on The Fan. Uh, And we will take you for that half hour uh, each day to kind of put a little ribbon on what will be a busy day or preview what would be a uh, very big evening coming up, whether it's a championship game like we will have next Monday night or a uh, big playoff game or next year a big uh, Yankee postseason game or a World Series game. I know you all have the Yankees penciled into the World Series now that, you know, without any questions uh, next year now that Cole is uh, in the fold. Uh, but like I said, good to be back. I hope everybody had a uh, very, very nice holiday. It was a, a sad one in a lot of ways, which I'll get to. A uh, lot, of, lot of people that... Uh, I was close to a lot of people who a lot of us were close to and knew very well have passed in recent weeks. It seemed to come in a multitude. So I will get to that a little, uh, a little uh, later in the half hour. Uh, so I was back on the fan to remember Don Imus last week when I got that news. I was down in Florida when the program director called me and told me about the passing of Don. Then I got a couple of calls right after Mark had called me. Uh, so I did some stuff, you know, uh, from Florida on Don, and then uh, also did part of a tribute show that I know they played last weekend that I uh, taped around midnight that night uh, that they had put together. As a matter of fact, Mark actually went back to the station to put together the tribute show and actually uh, had me voice the uh, the scripts that he had written uh, for, that, for that program. So he had put all that together in a very quick order uh, on the passing of a guy who was very, very important, as I'll note later, like I said, in the half hour. All right, big news today, of course, is that uh, Mike McCarthy no longer is a candidate for the giant head coaching position, goes to the Cowboys for five years. Is that a shocker? I don't think any of this is a shocker. We know there's a handful of candidates. We know there's a handful of jobs. Did the Giants surprise anybody by getting rid of Sherman? No. Uh, We all knew Sherman was going to go. He had to go. Would I have kept Gettleman? I think you guys know I would not have. 
I would have turned the page. I don't think Gettleman is the guy for the job. I think the Giants needed to get younger. I think they needed to go in that direction now. I thought I think, thought they needed to clean house. They decided not to. Exactly what his role will be, exactly how much he will allow other people to help make decisions, exactly how much latitude he will give the new head coach, exactly how much impact he will have into naming the new head coach is stuff we don't know. Hopefully not that much. Because the Giants need to make this, I think, exclusive of his decision-making. Because this coach has to be here past Gettleman. If he's not, this isn't going to work. And this coach has to have some say in personnel. If not, it's not going to work. Because I think that Gettleman has been extremely misleading and confusing in his leadership I, I, and I also think it's been awful. I mean, I really have. Uh, there's some young players there, but heck, if you were bringing in to a team that had no talent and you were drafting the top of the draft, you're going to hit on some guys too. I mean, come on. I could have brought you off the street. You would have picked Barkley. And if you can't pick in the top five with a team that has no talent and no Pro Bowl players and get guys who can play every day, well, then what are you doing? The Giants, in the, in the second year of their rebuilding plan, did not have a Pro Bowl player. And their defense never got better one day, not in game 5, 10, 15, 16, 17, that the defense get better. And they let a guy go who wound up starting yesterday in the playoffs, and they got nothing for him. At the cornerback position. So it shows you how they have allowed talent to walk out the door. They have not gotten a lot for it, and frankly, they haven't done a great job on a lot of different ways. Now, they do have some young talent on hand. They have a lot of work to do. The offensive line has never gotten back together. The defense still needs a couple of major, major pass rush players. And it needs leadership in the worst way. Now let's see where they go here. Is it Rule? Uh, I think the first time I mentioned Rule's name on the air might have been early November, late October, whenever I heard it. It was the first name I heard. I remember bringing it up on the air. I don't know Rule. I've never met him. I know he was with the Giants for one year. I've never talked to him in his stint at Baylor. Um, his resume is good. It's not otherworldly. He doesn't have head coaching experience, which worries me. I think right now the Giants need a really firm hand. I think they would have been better off with somebody who had head coaching experience. I think they're in that position right now. They have tried these assistants the last couple of years. It has not worked. And that's why I think they need somebody who comes in and says, I want some authority. I want some authority over this roster. I want some authority over my staff. I want to come in here and lead. They need leadership from the, quarter, from the head coach position, and they have not had that since Tom Coughlin. And they desperately need that before this football giant team is going to turn it around. In this league... You need to have presence and performance from owner, coach, and quarterback if you want to win. Yes, there can be different ways to build a team. You can have a big back like Henry, and that gets you to a certain level. Or you can be built with a great defense. Yeah, I understand there's always exceptions to every rule, but for the most part, you need your owner to perform, and recently the giant ownership has been, I think, divided and has been terrible in their performance. They have gotten nothing from their co head coaching position, and they've been woefully bad in terms of personnel and in terms of leadership. And that has to change. We know whose team this is now. We know they've put this team in the hands of Daniel Jones and Barkley and some young receivers, and hopefully a tight end who can stay on the field. And they'll start to get some youngsters on defense who can maybe be leaders. I haven't seen one yet surface, but they need that desperately, or they'll import it. But until they get it from the head coaching position, until they get a coach who has presence and who can provide direction and leadership in terms of cutting a roster, in terms of leading a roster, this team is going to be going nowhere. This has been constant losing now, year after year after year. This has been a rudderless franchise 
in every way. And I think getting rid of Sherman, which had to happen, he was not a head coach, but keeping Gettleman and having him just try to spin his job as he always seems to do is not the way to get that person in the door. And I hope he gets out of the way and allows somebody who can perform that way as a head coach. If they don't find that head coach, and maybe Rule is that guy, maybe he's not, I don't know. But if they don't get that guy, this will be more of the same from the Giants. And that's where they are right now. And that's the position leadership that the ownership has to take, is that they need a dynamic leader at the head coaching position. That's how you win. Giants won Super Bowls under two men, Parcells and Coughlin. Dynamic leaders. That's how you win. And the idea is not to get to 9-7 and seven or get to 8-8 eight and eight or put some fannies in the ballpark. The idea is to win and win big. And you do that when you have those kind of leaders, those kind of guys there and right there in the forefront leading your team. That's when you win. That's what it takes to win. It was a wild weekend. It always is. Too bad the Eagles lost their quarterback. I don't think they would have won the game, but they might have. Who knows? They weren't going anywhere anyway. It's a changing of the guard. Hey, when you see Brady lose and Tannehill win, when you see Breeze lose and Cousins win, it's a changing of the guard. And you have that. You know, you have no Brady there going forward. You have no Breeze. You have nobody named Manning. You have nobody named Roethlisberger. So you have new faces now. Yeah, you still have Rodgers and you still have Wilson. But you got a whole bunch of new kids now who are looking to make their names this weekend. And that's, the, you know, that's what happens in this league. And you also have some running backs who are flexing their muscles. And some running games that are making, making a statement led by Henry and what Cook has brought as they take their shows on the road this weekend to San Francisco and to Baltimore and to Kansas City and to Green Bay trying to see if they can, you know, keep their road dreams alive for another week. One thing that has happened in this league and has become very, very prominent in this league is it is no longer hard to win on the road in the postseason. It used to be. It used to be really hard to win on the road in the postseason in the NFL. That is not the case anymore. Why that dynamic has shifted so much, I'm not sure, but it has. And road teams winning is something that happens now. Day in, day out, year in. Year out happened again this weekend. You saw teams do it again. You've seen teams do it now year after year. It's become a norm in this league. Used to be very rare. Used to be the ones and two seeds were on their way to big things. Not anymore. Not an automatic like it used to be. Especially in wide open conferences. You know, you might, listen, I've thought all along we're headed for a Kansas City Baltimore showdown. I think we probably still are. We knew the NFC was wide open. It's really wide open. Back after this. All right, a couple of things on this past weekend's games. Number one, I would not have called pa offensive pass interference uh, in the New Orleans game. Did he push off slightly? Would I have called it? No. Did you think you were going to get an easy one because of what happened in New Orleans last year? Can't, can't officiate that way. Can't do things that way. Uh, Saints were outplayed. Sean Payton even admitted that. Uh, they clearly were. Minnesota deserved to win the game. They were the better team. I know it was another tough uh, pill for the uh, Saint fans to swallow, but their team was outplayed. I would not have reversed that call. I would not have called offensive pass interference other the touchdown was good. Tua today announced that he's going to make himself available for the draft. That's going to cause a lot, of, a lot of distress and a lot of sleepless nights for a lot of people because here is an incredibly talented generational quarterback, one of the most uh, accurate passes we've ever seen come out of the college game who now has a very complicated hip, one that you heard Dr. O'Brien describe as, at best, one that has a 25% chance of never being right. Um, somebody's going to take a chance on him in the first round. 
Um, do I know that they'll get lucky from a standpoint of health? I do not. He's been hurt three times in two years. That's way too much. And I've always thought of guys when they get hurt in college, they usually don't stay healthy in the pros. So if you want to stay away from them, for that reason, I understand. But if you are a team that has a big quarterback, if you are New Orleans and you have Breeze coming back, if you are Green Bay and you have Rodgers, if you're uh, the, the, the Pats and you have Brady coming back, if he does, and you take a flyer on this guy, you might wind up with a Hall of Fame player. That's the kind of risk if you're one of those teams you can take because if he is able to stay on the field, he will become, I think, one of the next generation great quarterbacks. Will he stay healthy? I don't know. There was another one that came out of Alabama once that people wondered whether he could give him three years. He had his ups and downs, but he had more ups and downs, and his name obviously was Joe Namath. And he gave the uh, this city and the Jets – a moment they still like to hold on to and have held on to for 50 years. So Tua has some clearly some physical issues, but he also has some incredible, incredible ability that makes it very, very alluring to be the guy to take a flyer on him. I would if I were in the right position and I could take a flyer on him, I would, because I think he's got that kind of talent. Um, four games this weekend. This is always the best weekend of the year. There's no question about it. Uh, four games, when you get the divisional playoff teams involved, it's always big, and uh, the teams are live on the road. Vikings are six-and-a-half point on the dogs in San Francisco. The question is, can their offensive line hold up to that nine of pass rush? Titans opened quickly as a 10-point on the dog. It went right to eight-and-a-half. So the early money came to the Titans against the Ravens in a game where – uh, obviously, ground games are going to be front and center after Henry's brilliant performance against the Pats. Utterly brilliant, unstoppable performance against the Pats. Uh, the Texans opened as an eight-point favorite over the Chiefs. Uh, eight-point underdog to the Chiefs, and now went to nine and a half very quickly. Uh, there's going to be a lot of points probably scored in that game, uh, especially from the Chiefs side. And uh, Seattle, in the battle of uh, quarterback winning uh, teams meeting, the two quarterbacks who have experience and who have won Super Bowls meet in Green Bay. The Packers are a three-and-a-half-point uh, favorite over Seattle, which got healthier this past week but got a very, very big advantage when Wentz, I don't want to say curiously, because I would never doubt anybody's injury, but, boy, it sure did not look like there was the kind of hit that would make it automatic that a player wouldn't come back. He did not come back, though. It obviously impacted the game. Give McCown credit for what he tried to accomplish, but he could not dent the end zone. And Clowney led a pass rush that gave the Eagles fits all day. Hey, give the Eagles a lot of credit. You know why? Because they have what you want as a fan. They have heart. They have guts. They have accountability. They were so banged up. They could have, they could have tossed this season away when they blew a 14-point lead to the Dolphins to go under 500 with five weeks to play. They blew a 14-point lead in the fourth quarter to the Dolphins and battled back and won the division. And then yesterday they hung in there and they battled more. You know what? They have a good culture, the Eagles. If you're an Eagle fan, you're proud of that team because, they, you know what, they give you a good day's work and they give you a fight every time they take the field. That's all you can ask for your team. They're not always going to win. They're not always going to be great. But when they're in there battling all the time, and that's what you get out of the Eagles, you get a fight every time they're out there. So kudos to them on what was a impressive, I thought, display down the stretch. Yeah, they beat bad teams, but you know what? They didn't have to beat anybody. They were playing with second and third stringers at a lot of positions. And then yesterday they get forced to play with a quarterback who this year was coaching, you know, was coaching football in high school for a while. You're not winning NFL playoff games with guys who were coaching in high school earlier in the season. It just doesn't happen. I mentioned that over this past couple of weeks and over the holidays, uh, we lost some folks, some that were uh, very prominent, some that were very near and dear. Uh, let me mention three. Number one. Back in 1989, Giants were playing great. Niners were great. A guy called me up and said, listen, I want to run a trip to San Francisco, and I want to take Giant fans, but I want to have Mike and the Mad Dog spearhead the trip. That's how Big Blue Travel started. The guy who started it was a guy named Barry Levin. 
Barry Levin passed away a couple days ago. He was a big man, very big man, way overweight at times in his life, obviously impacted his heart and his health, um, but he was a very generous guy, very philanthropic guy, very charitable guy. And for you Giant fans, you know that he had a great love for the Giants, and he started uh, Big Blue Travel, which he has run throughout all these years, and he passed away. He's been a uh, guy who was very close to the fan, very close to me through these years. So uh, to his family, our prayers and condolences to the Lieben family. Uh, I know how close he was to his kids. He was a great dad, loved kids, loved the Giants. Uh, he'll be missed. So Barry Lieben gone way too soon. David Stern was one of the great guests ever on a Mike and the Mad Dog show. If we list the guests, and we were fortunate enough to have so many great guests through the years, at the top of that list for guys who were always available, always ready to do a great job, always willing to argue the point and be cantankerous and curmudgeonly, one was George Young. The other was Commissioner David Stern. Obviously, you knew what happened to him a couple of weeks ago. He lost that fight, and now he's gone. David Stern, in the modern age of professional sport, in the glory days of professional sport that we have seen, the incredible growth of professional sport, there have been two commissioners who stand out in the modern age. One, of course, Pete Rozelle. The other, David Stern. David Stern transformed the NBA from a league that couldn't get its games on television. They were The championship games were taped, delayed, and run at 11.30 on CBS at night when he took over the league. They thought the NBA was going out of business when he took over the league. Did he have some players who arrived who made a difference? Absolutely. But his leadership, his direction, the smarts and the toughness with which he ran that league, there are a lot of very wealthy players and a, very, a lot of very wealthy fan, uh, owners and a lot of very happy fans of the NBA who owe this man a debt of gratitude. And he will be sorely missed. And like I said, He's someone that I uh, had a lot of respect for. I liked a lot. Always liked to talk with him. Very bright man about a lot of different things. Very confident guy. Very smart guy. One of the smartest guys I've ever met in sports. And uh, he will be very missed. And as I said, one of the great commissioners. The third, of course, was Don Imus. Don Imus uh, and I met up when we heard that the station was going to move to 66, and Don Imus was going to become the morning part of the fan schedule. FAN at the time was a struggling entity. It had not yet discovered Mike and the Mad Dog. It was bleeding money. The sports talk format as a viable concern, which has become such a a prevalent one in America. There are thousands of sports talk stations in this country. There are, they are all over the AM dial. They are now all over the FM dial. The first one ever, the test case, was WFAN. Sports talk as a all-encompassing format would not have made it if it had not started in New York with Don Imus anchoring it because of his brand because of his revenue producing show and what he provided early on for FAN to be able to stop the bleeding, gain some revenue and get a chance to grow shows of its own like Mike and the Mad Dog, which came through the I Miss in the Morning program. Dog came through the program. I came through the program. He promoted the Mike and the Mad Dog program and Mike and the Mayor was in the afternoon, and Imus was in the morning for 18 years. Because of that, FAN became one of the iconic stations in the history of this country. Because of that, guys like Dog and myself and others have gone on to wonderful careers, all because of the leadership, the stability, the professionalism that Don Imus brought in the beginning.
We owe him an incredible uh, debt of gratitude, one of the giants, one of the icons in the history of radio. When the history of radio is written, he will be right at the top of the list, as he should be. And to uh, Deidre and Wyatt and all the other kids, we send our condolences. And as someone who benefited greatly by his presence, again, he will be sorely missed. We'll see you tomorrow.